One of the things I like most about math is how connected the different areas and subfields of mathematics are. Connections that some of them seem natural and some of them seem just outlandish, but it's rare to find two subdisciplines of math that don't have something to do with one another. And so one of the things that helps me when I'm thinking about the concepts that we're learning right now, the idea of the center and the centralizer of groups and elements, um, is to have a visual representation for these things. What do they look like? How can I visualize what they are? And a really convenient way to visualize the center and the centralizer in a group uh, is to use a graph. And when I say graph, I don't mean graph in the sense of graphing a function in the xy plane like we learn in algebra in high school. I mean a graph in the sense of graph theory. And a, gra a graph in graph theory has a set of vertices, think of these as like a set of points, and edges, which we can think of as lines that connect some of those points to some other of those points. Um, and group theory and graph theory actually have a lot that they can to tell one another. Um, and so in this video, we're going to take a look at how to visualize the center of a group and the centralizer of an element if that group is a small enough finite group to make it practical for us to sketch a graph with its elements as the vertices. So first of all, why is a graph an appropriate thing for thinking about centers and centralizers? Well, let's think about the relation we can define on the elements of a group, which is the commutes with relation. So we define x is related to y in my group G if x and y commute with one another. What can we say about that relation? Well, first of all, it's a reflexive relation because every element commutes with itself. Therefore, for all elements x in my group, x times x is equal to x times x. They're both equal to x squared. Um, so every element commutes with itself. That's why every element belongs to its own centralizer, as we saw in the last video. The other thing we can say about this relation is that it's a symmetric relation. If x commutes with y, then it's also true that y commutes with x. Because if you look at this equation that defines commutativity for these two elements, if we trade places between the left and right hand sides, I get the same equation that I had originally because of the symmetric property of equality. So for all x's and y's in my group, if x is related to y, that means that xy is equal to yx. But again, by the symmetric property of equality, that means that yx would be equal to xy, which implies that y is related to x. So this commutes with relation is reflexive and it's symmetric. Now, if this were an equivalence relation, we would be in a hog heaven because then we'd be able to look at equivalence classes of elements inside of my group and split it up and we would get this nice partition and we'd be able to say, in this partition, everything commutes with everything. In this other set of my partition, everything commutes with everything. And so forth and so forth and so forth. The problem with that is that there's always something, namely the identity element in any group, that commutes with everything. And so remembering that um, remembering that for an equivalence relation, equivalence classes either need to be completely the same or they're completely disjoint, right? Every equivalence class defines a partition. If this were an equivalence relation, then that would mean that the identity element belongs to every element's equivalence class, which would mean that every element belonged to every element's equivalence class, and we would only get one big giant equivalence class, which is not a very interesting partition. Well, that doesn't happen. We don't actually partition the set into these equivalence classes because this relation is not an equivalence relation. Precisely because of that identity element, this is not a transitive relation. The commutes with relation is not transitive. So it's not true that if x is related to y and y is related to z, then y, uh, x is related to z. If x commutes with y and y commutes with z, it does not necessarily follow that x commutes with z. In the dihedral group of the triangle, for example, T commutes with the identity. Why? Well, because everything commutes with the identity. The identity commutes with R. Why? Because the identity commutes with everything. And yet it's not true that T commutes with R, because TR is not the same thing as RT. So we don't actually have an equivalence relation, but we do have a reflexive and a symmetric operation uh, relation. And any relation which is both reflexive and symmetric can be well represented by a graph. So we take all of our elements and put them as the vertices of my graph. And we can connect any two related elements, related by this relation, with an edge. And because we have a symmetric relation, that edge goes in both directions. So we don't need to draw little arrows on it and turn it into what graph theorists call a digraph or a directed graph. 
Um, so an undirected graph is a great way to visualize a relation on a finite set that's both reflexive and symmetric. Because it's reflexive, we're going to assume that every, uh, every vertex is also connected to itself. So a graph in graph theory looks like this. It has a set of vertices, which you think which you usually depict as points, and edges, which we depict as line segments connecting those points to one another. And so what we want to do, again, imagining that every vertex is also connected to itself because our relation is reflexive, is to let the elements in my group be the vertices in what I'm going to call the commuter's graph. And the edges show us which elements commute with, with which other elements. Right? So every time I connect a pair of elements with an edge, it means that those two elements commute with one another. So what this does is it's going to give us a nice little visual way to represent uh, this commuting relation inside of finite groups that are small enough that we can actually sketch the graph and, and look at this graph for some understanding. So let's start with just a, a basic group, the integers modulo 5, uh, the additive group of integers modulo 5. So as we said a couple of videos ago, in this group, the operation is commutative for all pairs of elements. This is an abelian group. In other words, every pair of elements commutes with, every, with each other, right? So x plus y is equal to y plus x mod 5 for all x's and y's in my group. And that means that if my group elements are the vertices in this commuter's graph, the edges, which are supposed to connect every pair of elements that commute with one another, I'm going to be able to draw an edge from everything to everything. Why? Because the element 0 commutes with everything, therefore I can draw an edge to everything in addition to itself. And then the same is true of 1, it commutes with everything, 2 commutes with everything, 3 commutes with everything, and 4 commutes with everything. So when I'm done drawing the graph, the commuter's graph for z mod 5, what I get is this pentagram. This is what graph theorists would call a complete graph. Um, and complete just means that every element, every vertex, is connected to every other vertex by an edge. Every pair of vertices shares an edge. And I think the argument that we just made about z mod 5 can transparently be extended to show that the commuter's graph is a complete graph exactly when every element commutes with every other element, and that's true exactly when g is an abelian group. So what this does is it gives us a way of visualizing what abelian looks like for a group. An abelian group, if we sketch its commuter's graph, that graph is going to be a complete graph. That there's no pair of elements that don't commute with one another that would be missing an edge inside of my commuter's graph. So that's kind of an interesting example, but not super interesting, because everything commutes with everything. So let's pass now to an example of a group that we know is not an abelian group. The group of symmetries of a pentagon, D5, or the dihedral group of order 10. So here are the 10 elements. Uh, which are symmetries of my pentagon. The identity symmetry, rotation by 72 degrees counterclockwise, and a reflection, and all of the powers and combinations thereof. Using the rules of the dihedral group, we can write all of them with a T in the front uh, in the way that we've done here. All right, so here are the 10 elements. Now the question is, what commutes with what? So we'll go one element at a time, starting from the identity. Well, again, by the identity property that every group enjoys, the identity commutes with every element in the group, which means in my commuter's graph, I can draw an edge from the identity to absolutely everything else. So we've got a lot going on already, because the identity element commutes with every element in the group, including, of course, itself. All right, so let's move on to R. What does R commute with? So I'm going to make the claim here that R, the rotation by 72 degrees, the only things that it commutes with are other rotations. To verify that, let's get out our handy-dandy virtual pentagon and apply some of these symmetries. So here's our pentagon. Um, and what I'd like to know, again, is if I apply a rotation to my pentagon, so there's a single rotation, and then I pick up any other element in my dihedral group of order 10, will that element commute with my rotation? So, for example, if I do rotate followed by reflect, RT, is that going to give me the same symmetry as if I did T followed by R? And the answer is no. In this symmetry, the vertex 5 is up here matched up with 1. In RT, it was the vertex 2 instead. So that's a different symmetry. RT is not the same thing as TR. Um, but on the other hand, if I did R followed by, I don't know, R to the third. So here's R to the third followed by R. So R followed by R cubed. 
Is that the same thing as if I did r cubed, and then I followed that by r? And you might say, well, duh. Each time all I've done is I've done a total of four consecutive r's. And you'd be right. So another thing that we didn't mention in the previous video, because we were looking at t, and t wasn't as interesting, is that not only will every element belong to its own centralizer, because it commutes with itself, but every element also commutes with all powers of itself. So everything that belongs to the cyclic subgroup that something generates is also going to be a part of the centralizer for that element. Um, so not only does r commute with itself, it also commutes with r squared, it commutes with r to the third, it commutes with r to the fourth. So what that tells me is it tells me that, yes, r commutes only with other rotations, but that the same is also true for the other powers of r. Same, same, and same. So when I look at the powers of r, the cyclic subgroup generated by r, which consists of these five vertices up here, um, all of them are connected one to another by the commuting, commutes with relation. They all commute with one another up here. Okay, so if that's the case for the powers of r, what happens with t? What does t commute with? Well, just like in the previous video where we saw it for the uh, equilateral triangle, t commutes only with itself and with the identity element. And so the only, thing, the only uh, edges that we can connect to t is the edge that connects it back to the identity. And the same is true for the other tr, tr squared, tr cubed, tr to the fourth. Remember, these are the five different reflective uh, axes of symmetry, if you like, uh, for the pentagon. And all of them have the same property that t does, that the only things that they commute with are themselves and the identity. So one of the things that the centralizers do that, that makes this graph, this graph sort of shows very vividly, is that it kind of divides the dihedral group into these two different types of symmetries. We have the rotations up here that are all sort of one big happy family with one another. All of the pure rotations commute one with another. And then on the other hand, we have all these elements down here, these reflections, which don't commute with anything except for themselves and one. And so that kind of splits this group in half into one big happy rotation family up here, and then all of these loners uh, that are the reflections down here that all have that in common with one another. So what are some of the things based on this commuter's graph that we can now say? Well, this is not a complete graph. Right? There are examples of elements that are not connected by an edge. T is not connected to R, for example. R squared is not connected to TR cubed. And since it's not a complete graph, by the theorem that we had on the screen a few minutes ago, that means that this is not an abelian group, right? Because only abelian groups have complete commuter's graphs, and vice versa. Now, how can we talk about the center? So anytime we're visualizing the commutativity properties, we can also hopefully understand what the center of, uh, of a group is. And so the center, remember, by definition, is the set of elements that commute with everything inside of a group. So in my commuter's graph, I'm going to be looking for those elements that share an edge with everything. What are my elements that are all, uh, that are connected to every other element of the group uh, by an edge? And only the identity element in this example satisfies that property. The identity is connected to absolutely everything else, but every other element is missing at least one connection inside of this graph. And so the center of the dihedral group, D5, the center consists only of the identity element. Contrast that to the situation in Z mod 5. If I ask which vertices in this graph are adjacent, share an edge, with all other vertices, you'll tell me not only does 0 share an edge with every other vertex, but 1 shares an edge with every other vertex, 2 shares an edge with every other vertex, 3 likewise, 4 likewise. So in Z mod 5, the center the set of vertices that share an edge with every other vertex actually is the whole thing. Every vertex satisfies that property. And so the center of Z mod 5 is Z mod 5. Again, why? Because Z mod 5 is an abelian group. And for an abelian group, the center of the group is the entire group, because every element commutes with everything. So that's how we can read the center of a group off of one of these graphs. How about the centralizer of an element in that group? For the centralizer, we're asking the question, what commutes with me? So we're picking up an element and we're saying, what commutes with this element? So in our graph, then, all we're going to be looking for is, what are the vertices adjacent to me? So you pick out an element and you say, what is this element connected to by an edge? 
Remember, since graphs are not transitive, it doesn't count to connect something by two edges. I can't say that r to the fourth is connected to t because of this path that leads from here to the identity to t. Instead, when I say shares an edge or adjacent, I mean you have to actually have an edge connecting those two vertices. Right? And that's the case in, in graph theory as well. Otherwise, we call it a path instead of an edge. So the centralizer is the set of all vertices that share an edge with g. So the centralizer of r, for example, is an answer to the question, what shares an edge with r? Well, the identity element does because it shares an edge with everything. But then r also shares an edge with r squared. It shares this edge with r cubed, and it shares that edge with r to the fourth. So the centralizer of r inside of uh, the dihedral group of order 10 is this subset, e r r squared, r to the third, r to the fourth. Not only is it a subset, but of course it's also a subgroup uh, because every centralizer of a given element in a group is also a subgroup. So that's it for this little extra bonus exploration of a connection between abstract algebra and graph theory. There are a lot more such connections uh, that you can forge that, again, inform each inform the other discipline. So there are things we can learn in graph theory that tell us something about abstract algebra, and there are things we can learn in abstract algebra that tell us things about graph theory. But that's a great and very fertile area of, of scholarship and active research. Uh, so if you're interested in both subjects, you can come up with some really neat uh, research topics uh, that can really, they have a fairly, fairly low barrier to entry. You have to know a little bit of graph theory, a little bit of abstract algebra, algebra, but you can really quickly get to some interesting problems, many of which mathematics doesn't know the answer to yet. Uh, so this is just one, and it helps me, again, because I like the visual that this provides, that helps me to keep straight the, the definition of the center of a group and the centralizer of an element.